All right, today we are doing a about Palm Sunday. How many of you like donkeys? They're great, aren't they? Yeah. When I was a kid, I used to laugh because we used to have the King James Version in our church. And it would say on there that Jesus rode in on an ass. It literally said that. Pastor, how could you say that? Well, that's what, that's what a donkey is. And so, you know what? If, uh, in the Bible, if, if Jesus could do great things on an ass, there's a hope for me. Uh, <laughs> hey, listen, that's what the, look at the King James Version. That's what it says. Okay? All right, sorry, everybody. But anyhow, why would it matter to me that Jesus' riding was on a donkey into Jerusalem? Why would it matter? What's the big deal about Jesus riding into Jerusalem, and what's the big story about that? Well, we're going to look at it in a few moments, and there's a donkey, all right? And, and there's a couple of facts I want to tell you about donkeys. You may not know it, but you know that donkeys live to be about 30 to 40 years old. Some of them can grow to be uh, as old as 60, and donkeys have long ears to kind of keep them, that's like an air condition, all right? Another reason is they can hear up to over a mile in, in distance, that's pretty cool. Uh -huh. Also, here's some, something really helpful to you, okay? According to the London Times, more people are killed by donkeys yearly than by airplanes. So if you don't get on, a, you don't get on an airplane, don't be a donkey, okay? And so here, there we go, Sheck. All right. <laughs> But donkeys are really interesting animals. In fact, you know, in the, uh, in the antiquity of that day, donkeys were a symbol of peace. And so if a king came on a, on a donkey, it was peace. Isn't it interesting that Jesus comes to Jerusalem on a donkey, not a horse, which talks about in Revelation 19. That's when he comes as a conquering king. But he came as a and peaceful. Now, just to kind of help everyone out just for a few moments, to understand how important this is, a lot of people don't understand that the Jewish people were under subjugation to the Roman government. They used to have their own place that used to be their own land. They lost it about, uh, about 700 years before and then never had it since then, but they rebuilt the temple and Herod built the temple from again and this is their place where they would worship God, but they were waiting for their Messiah to come. And they believe he's going to come as a conquering king. They were expecting Jesus to come on a horse. And they expected him to come powerfully and overthrow the Romans and put them back in power again. But when Jesus came on a donkey, they didn't see it. Because they didn't see what they wanted to see. Sometimes we miss God because we want him to come in a way we want him to come. But sometimes he's right beside us. And we're not even aware of it. In fact, you know, this Passion Week, they call it Passion. This is the Passion Week. Today starts it. It is one, one of the most, um, it, is, it is the biggest part of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In fact, when you look at it, uh, most of the Gospels, um, about two-fifths of the final week of Jesus is in the book of Matthew. About three-fifths, the final week in Mark. Luke has one-third. John has about almost half and out of the 89 chapters and four gospels was about the last week. And four chapters for the first, the last 30 years. And can you believe it or not, 29 chapters in the gospels of Jesus' last week. So it's a big issue. It's a big, one of the biggest moments in Jesus' life. He came to be a sacrifice for us because all of us know we have something to pay. Something to pay. How would you like, how many of you have college loans? Oh, praise God. How many, have, how many have car payments? House payments? Well, how would you like if someone came to you today and said, listen, I'm gonna pay all your debts today. Actually, there's someone here that will do that. No, I'm just kidding. Wouldn't that be nice to say that $300,000 on the house is paid, my, car, my college $600,000 is paid, <laughs> and I could walk out of here debt free well Jesus came to pay the debts of our sin because we all know we got something wrong and God loves us so much that he paid our debt and so he's coming in to Jerusalem that way now here's a little colt that's a baby donkey go, go again Okay. that's international for how cute for those of you who don't know how to speak ah all right. but you know this, so Jesus went on a, a colt that was never ridden before 
And so he enters, and we're going to read the passage of Scripture, and then we're going to look at what it means, what does it mean to us? So what? Jesus came on a donkey. What's the big deal about that? You're going to see, it's pretty extraordinary why Jesus came in on a donkey. Let me say something about reading the Bible. When you read the Bible, what it says is usually face value. We're not trying to find secret numerology in there and secret codes and all that. Don't get caught in that kind of stuff. If someone comes to you with all this crazy stuff, read it for what it says. The Bible is designed for children, for PhDs, and those who barely got their GEDs, okay? It's for everyone, and even those who wear their BVDs, okay? It's for everybody. And so what we want to encourage you with, everybody, is that the Bible is written as it's written, and we need to know the general consensus of what it's saying, but also the Bible goes deeper and deeper. And the more you look into it, the more you can find. But the general purpose is not lost. Does that make sense? I just want to encourage you with that. Okay, so let's gonna, we're going to go ahead and read the Bible. We're going to read from a couple different uh, gospel accounts, and we're going to piece this together. Are you guys ready? All right, all right, all right. Okay, so by the way, Jesus comes uh, to Jerusalem at this point on the Jewish calendar, the 10th day of Nisan, not the car. Okay, April they think it was April the 14th, we believe it was. I'm, gonna, I'm April the 6th, excuse me. April 6th, 32 AD, they kind of tried to, I don't have time to tell you how they got that number. Different scholars thought that, but he came in on that day. And, uh, and what happened in the Passover, there are three major holidays that everyone needs to show up for. The first one's a Passover, the second one is Pentecost, and the third one is the, is the, tabern is the Tabernacles. Now the first one, Penny, uh, sorry, the first one is the Passover. The Passover, if you know what it means, is the is Israelites were under um, slavery in Egypt for 430 years. God rose up a deliverer named Moses, and the last of the ten plagues was the killing of the firstborn male. And so the only way they could protect themselves is they had to take a sacrificial lamb and put the blood on the top and the two posts of the door, like a cross. And at night, if everyone was under that blood, the angel of death would pass over, hence Passover. What's so interesting is that Jesus, when he came on the scene, after he was baptized, John, his, his cousin, said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the earth. Now, I don't have time to talk to you why there's blood sacrifices. It was something very common back in those days. Remember, God speaks to us on our level of understanding, and that's how he spoke to the ancient civilizations in their own vernacular, and even though we don't do that today per se. But it still has a meaning in it, which we're going to get into at another time. So here we go, guys. Here we go. We're going to go ahead and read it today and, uh, and, and what we're going to look at. So first of all, now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethpage, and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, we don't know who they are, but he just sent them out, and said to them, go into the village in front of you, and uh, immediately, as you do, as you enter it, you'll find a colt, that's a donkey, tied to which no one has ever sat, just a, a, a donkey, no one's ever used it, no one ever rode it before. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this, say this. The Lord has need of it, and, send, and I'll send it back immediately. Now, what is interesting as I'm reading about that, it's not uncommon in that day, it's called agaria, is that you could go up to somebody, if you're in a dignitary, say, I need to borrow your car. I'll bring it back. Agaria. So, which is amazing. It's like, imagine going to a dealership. It's a brand new C8 Z06 Corvette. Okay? And you walk in, and you say... Agaria. What do you mean? Well, I need to borrow for the king. And you get in there, start it up, and walk out. I mean, can you imagine doing that? So here you got a brand new cult. Brand new, and he walks up and says, I'm going to take it. And they're okay with it. Okay, apparently, the news about Jesus was spreading. He just had an opportunity where he um, had a miracle where Lazarus was raised from the dead. His popularity is going to the highest level at this point. So what are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it. And they went away and found a colt tied to the door outside the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing, right? Untying the colt. And they told him what Jesus said. And they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it 
and he sat on it, and many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. This is why we have Palm Sunday. So Jesus is coming from the Mount of Olives, goes to the Kidron Valley to the bottom, up to the gate, east gate, and goes on that way. So there's a procession going on. Now, what's interesting, he comes in like this. It was very much uh, how a king would come, a dignitary. But you have to understand the Passover's happening. It's the month of Nisan. It's the 10th day. The 10th day of the festival, what you're supposed to do is, is pick out the lamb you're going to slay on the 14th day. So you pick out the lamb on the 10th day. On the 14th day is the day. It's the, the, so guess when Jesus comes in? The day where you select the lamb. Significant. So what's interesting, he comes on with an entourage, and what happens is there's already a lot going on. If you go to a ball game, and if you go to a Yankee Stadium, for example, and you're going in, and there's a bunch of people going in, it's already crowded to begin with, and all of a sudden, as you're trying to go into the gate for Yankee Stadium, there's this rickroll, this guy coming down in a, you know, in a big entourage with police uh, escort, and he's gonna, in, a, in a big Escalade coming down, and like, what's going on? Oh, here's coming, the, the celebrity is coming. Who is this? Derek Jeter. Okay, so you know, everyone's like, wow, Derek Jeter's coming. Well, imagine that, you're there right now, it's crowded, you're trying to go in the temple, and everyone's making a big riffraff about who's this guy? It's Jesus, Jesus who? He's the guy that raised him from the dead, Lazarus. And everyone's talking about, let's see what's going on. So a bunch of folks go over to see what's happening. They see what's happening, they're laying down their jackets. Hail, King of the Jews, right? So it's almost like this where you come in you, it, on the limo, or they call this the beast, by the way. I find it very interesting that they, uh, they call the pre president's limo a beast. That's for next week. Anyhow, this is, a, this is a bulletproof car. It can take bombs and everything like that. It's pretty cool. So he came on, Jesus was coming on, basically had an entourage with him going down that. So, and those who went before him and those who followed him were shouting, Hosanna, which means come save us. Come save us, come save us. Now, the religious community back in that day, the Pharisees, which would be like the conservative churches, those are the ones you can't do anything. Can't smoke, can't chew, can't hang out with girls who do, all right? Then you had the Sadducees, those were the liberal churches that didn't believe the, you know, too much in the supernatural. So you had those folks, and they were freaking out because, remember, uh, Israel, the Jewish people were under Roman, under the Rome. And, uh, and these religious guys were living pretty high. You know, they, they had a good fixing with the Romans and they didn't want to lose their power. So they were worried about this guy, Jesus, because he's more popular than they are. And here comes Jesus. And they're, they're freaking out because they're worried they're gonna lose their power, lose their clout, lose their status. So many times you and I wanna have our own status. We wanna, we wanna have a relationship, we want it our way. And we don't wanna listen to Jesus because it's gonna mean we have to change. So they were so blinded by their own desires. Now, that never happens to us, right? We're never blinded by our own desires. All right? So blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David, Hosanna, in the highest. Just as it's written, now they begin to quote, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. That is 500 years written before in Zechariah 9. His disciples did not understand these things first, but when Jesus was glorified, they understood it. Have you ever noticed in your life sometimes you're like, why did I go through this? And you look back maybe 10 months, 10 years, 10 minutes perhaps, <laughs> like why, did I, why, why was I late? And there was a car accident on the road, that could have been me. You don't always know why things happen the way they do, but then you see it later on. I'm like, thank you God for not answering my prayer. I would have married the wrong woman. Whew. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I thank him almost not every day, but I thank him a lot, right? Thank you, God, that they didn't work out because I would never have met my wife, you know? And sometimes, at the time, you're like, the world's falling apart. Why would I wanna live? And God's protecting you from something. Be careful, just trust God and watch him take your life and do something beautiful out of it. If you'll give him your life, the Bible says he works all things for good for those that love him and are called according to his purposes doesn't mean he caused a painful thing to happen in your life, but he can take your tragedy and make it a triumph. He can take the trash of your life and make it a treasure. That's what God can do. God can take the, the stumbling stone and turn it into a stepping stone. That's what God does in our lives. So I wanna encourage you to trust God in your life. 
So when Jesus was glorified. So what happens is, then they remembered these things that had been written about him and had been done to him and the, and the crowd that had been with him when they, he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead. Continue to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard what has done. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the whole world's going after him. So up to this point, Jesus, when he entered in his first three and a half years of ministry, he tried to keep his popularity at bay. When he would heal someone, he said, don't tell anybody. Because he was setting up for him to leave. He was training up disciples, 12 of them, and another um, 500 people that would follow around with him. He had ladies with him as well. And in fact, the first people to see him when he rose from the dead were ladies. The first evangelists in the Bible were ladies. That's for next week. But anyhow, so pretty amazing. And so Jesus was, that's why the Bible is for women, not against women. So Jesus was amazing. And so he was building up and he was doing great things and they were hoping this was gonna be the king. So he tried to keep his, his identity incognito. But on this day, he made it known. By him riding on a donkey, anyone that understood the scriptures understood what was going on. He's coming as a king, a king in peace, riding in on a donkey. Amazing. And as he's going down, it's a very emotional time for him because he knows it's gonna be the, the most difficult time of his life, the week. Now, why would it matter to me that Jesus riding was on a donkey into Jerusalem? Well. Jesus went public giving his identity as the Messiah. I am the Messiah. Why does it matter? Jesus fulfilled prophecies. Let me show you this. This is amazing. In Zechariah 9.9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughters of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous, having salvation. He humbled and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. So Jesus came in. It was actually um, scripture all about it, which is absolutely amazing. The second thing we see here is, is the prophecy of Daniel. Daniel came 700 years before Jesus came. It's one of the most amazing books of the Bible, one of the most prolific prophets that ever was. He predicts Jesus coming. Now, this is seen as controversial to some, but I find it quite amazing. As I've done research this past week, I was looking at what it talked about in the Bible about this, that it says in Daniel... There's a scholar by the name of Sir Robert Anderson who wrote the book called The Coming Prince, and he did the work on it. Let me show you something, what Daniel said. This is what Daniel wrote 700 years before Christ came. We're going to read it, and we're going to look at it, okay? Now listen and understand. Seven sets of seven plus 62 sets of seven will pass from the time of the command given to rebuild Jerusalem until a ruler... Okay, so what happened was this. They used to have their own kingdom. They had a temple. They had all that. They lost it. Babylonians came and took them over. They went into captivity. Uh, the Persians let them come back and to rebuild their temple. And then they were able to come back, but they're always under the rule of other people, including the Romans. So what's interesting is, when you look at this, God bless you. You can say that in church, right? If you can't say that in church, where can you say it? Okay. Seven, says the seven plus 62. So the anointed one comes to Jerusalem will be rebuilt. With streets and strong defenses, despite this perilous times. So basically what's going to happen, according to what we can read, uh, in March 14, 445 B.C., there's a Babylonian, uh, what's his name here? Let me make, if I say his name correctly, all right? Arcturxus Longamanus, okay? The Persian monarch gave the command they could go back. And they believe that was March 14th. 445, looking at the Persian calendar, which is apparently 360 days instead of 365 days. So what, this, what Sir uh, Anderson did is he counted from this thing forward. And he did the math, which is 383 years. That's, that's when you do all the 62 sevens and all that. Okay, And it ends up being 173 days, 173,880 days. Is that's what the math is for, for uh, the, that 483 years. So he began at March 14th at 45 BC, and he counted. And when he came to the date, it happened to be April the 6th, 32 AD, on the 10th day of Nisan. That's the day Jesus came and said, I am the Messiah. That day. Now, it's pretty amazing when you look at this. Again, we're not going to go through it all right now, but it's pretty amazing when you look at this because what does it say? 
It says in Daniel, it says that this will happen. The anointed one, the Messiah, right, comes to Jerusalem, will be rebuilt. It was rebuilt, the temple, with streets and strong defenses, despite the perilous times. It was perilous times. The Jewish people were so, still under subjection to the Romans. After this period of 62 sets of seven, the anointed one will be killed, appearing to have accomplished nothing. Appearing to accomplish nothing. What happened to Jesus? He was here three and a half years, and he apparently accomplished nothing. He died. Now, a lot of people think they understand how Christ is going to come back. I guarantee you, we miss it the first time. We're going to miss it the second time. Why? Because the enemy is not going to tell us top secret things. I mean, God's not going to tell us top secret information all the way to the T. He tells us the general revelation of what's going to happen when he comes back. But God's going to surprise us all, as he did the first time. So when people come back and tell them, well, he's going to come back, they don't know. They don't know. It's good to study it. It's good to look at it. You can put the pieces together. But the truth of the matter is, God has a covert operation. He gave you the basic information. And when it happens, you go, oh, that's how it works. Now, if I just made you upset, I'm sorry. I know you all want to be told what's going to happen. God gives us enough mystery so we have to draw closer to him. So isn't that amazing, everybody? So that's the day. So Jesus presents himself as the lamb. And then, 10, and then the 14th, the lamb is sacrificed and Jesus dies on the cross. Now, I find that amazing. I find that amazing that when you do this, it talks about this. Here it is, 700 years before. Isn't the Bible amazing? Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, talks about how he was pierced for our transgressions. So then we have, which to me is absolutely amazing, is this following one, Abraham and Isaac. Now, if you don't know who Abraham is, Abraham is the first person of promise that God worked through. He called him out of Haran, and he told him to go to a land he did not know where he was going. How many don't know where you're going? There's hope for us. So he says, I'm going to show you. So he takes Abraham out. He promises, I will make you a great nation. He promises Abraham he's going to make him a great nation, and he's going to have children of the promise with him and Sarah. He has to wait 25 years for the promise. Can you imagine? I get, I get angry if they have to wait 25 minutes for fries. I can't imagine waiting 25 years for the promise. Can you imagine? 25 years. In fact, they took matters in their own hands to try to make it help God out and it ended up being a problem. But God still blessed the problem. So now he's 100 years old and he gives him a child named Isaac. You know what Isaac means? Laughter. That's why we like to laugh at church. We think God likes to have fun, right? You know, God designed humor, by the way. So Abraham and Isaac. So what happens is he takes Abraham, and takes Isaac, and it's his child of promise. Now look at this. In Genesis 22, 1. You're going to see the parallel here in a few moments. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, he said, here I am. That's a good place to be. When God calls you, say, here I am. He said, take your son your only son, Isaac. What does the Bible say in John 3, 16? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And what does he tell Abraham? Abraham, bring your only son. So he brings his son of promise. Take your son, only Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah. Moriah is Jerusalem. Mount Moriah is a temple mount where we have today. And offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains. And you're like, what is this child's sacrifice? They were pretty barbaric. Well, we do that today too, by the way, to a certain extent. Child sacrifice was unfortunately more common than it would like to be. God never, ever commanded anyone to do that for real. He was just testing him. But he never required anyone to sacrifice their children in that regard. But nevertheless, he's, track, he's checking him here. And offer him on this burnt offering on one of these mountains, which I will tell you. So Abraham rose early at the 815 service. <laughs> Listen, if you'd like to go to the 815 service, we would love to get to come. You don't have any children. Okay, make more room. Okay. Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his what? Donkey. Here we go again. A lot of donkeys in the Bible, by the way. Is Balaam's donkey and all that. Saddled his donkey and what? And took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. They took the donkey and what did they do? They put wood on the donkey. He was a beast of burden. 
And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. What do you see? Mount Moriah. That's the place where, they, where Jesus was crucified on that hill outside of Jerusalem. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. So what did the donkey do? The donkey brought in the sacrifice and stopped, and now he's walking up the hill. Who's walking up the hill? Who? Isaac, the only begotten son. So the donkey brings him in for the sacrifice. Jesus rides into Jerusalem to be presented. And then he's going to have to go on the hill. Now check this out. Stay here with the boy, and I and the boy will go over there, worship, and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood, burnt up, took the wood of the burnt offering, and what? Laid it on Isaac. What happened to Jesus? He took the wood. They laid it on Jesus. What did he do? He had to climb a hill, Mount Moriah. He climbed the hill. Here you have seven or 900 years beforehand, you have Isaac carrying the wood up to the hill, Mount Moriah. Jesus comes later on, carries the wood, God's only beloved son, up to the hill of Moriah to be a sacrifice. Now, let check this out. So they laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took his hand and the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them together, and Isaac said, the son said, my father, he said, here I am, my son. Behold, the fire and the wood. But where is the sacrifice? Lamb for the burnt offering. Where's the lamb? And you know what happens? He says, he's going to do it. God says, don't do it. And they found a ram in the thicket. Not a lamb. They found a ram in the thicket. Now, it's so interesting. Look what Abraham tells Isaac. He says it prophetically, which simply means he's speaking what's going to happen. I don't think he even understands what he's saying. There's hope for me and you. So Abraham said, what? God will what? Provide for himself the lamb. God will provide the lamb himself. Who did God provide for a lamb of himself? He sent Jesus himself. God in the flesh. And Jesus took that wood and went on the hill. So Abraham said, God will provide for himself a lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them together. And so way back then, he was proclaiming, and the donkey brought him in. This is why it's so interesting about the donkey. You see, the Bible puts these things together so you and I can see what God is doing. Isn't that amazing? So what do we see? Jesus went public by giving an identity to, as a Messiah. Jesus fulfilled the prophecies, and Jesus gives us a choice how to accept them. Four types of people there that day. There were the religious groups that were just, they were happy in their own way. Maybe you're happy in your own way. Maybe you got God figured out and I don't want to mess up the apple cart. I, I, I like the way, my life the way it is. I'm happy with church. Church is over here. Work is over here. My little propensities are over here. I'm happy the way I am. Are you willing to give up your religious garb? Are you willing to give up your comfort level? And then there were people that had no idea what was going on. They're just hanging out. Maybe that's you today. Maybe someone brought you to church. You're like, I don't even know why I'm here. And maybe you, some of you are, are, are expecting God to do something new in your life. But he requires something, a sacrifice. So Jesus gives us a choice of how to accept. I'm going to ask that the worship team can make their way up. So let me ask you a question today. Which one are you? Are you the crowd that has God figured out already? You know, okay, I'm going to keep God at his distance. Are you the person that realizes that you need Jesus? So I don't know where you are today. The Bible says it's appointed to man and woman to die once, then comes the judgment. You see, all of us are going to have to give an account how we live our lives. And if we're really honest, we all got stuff, don't we? Come on, everybody. If you don't think you got stuff, you really got stuff. Don't let me spell out what stuff is. It means stuff. So, but what happens is this. God loves you so much that he paid the price for you. And so it's not about perfect people. It's about surrendered people. 